Well, good morning. I'm, I'm uh, pleased to see such a good turnout of hearty souls. Uh, I don't know if you're tired of this weather, but I certainly am, and so I'm impressed that, that you've come out to join us. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the New York City Food Policy Center at Hunter College and the CUNY School of Public Health. I'm Jan Poppendick, and I'm the policy director at the center and one of the founders, together with my colleague Nick Freudenberg, the distinguished professor of public health back there in the corner, whose spectacular, concise, brief, and to the point performance on MSNBC yesterday afternoon on the cycle, you can see on the web, and we'll be putting a link on our website. Um, it was a model for how to get your points across in a short time. Uh, I'm impressed. Um, so we are this morning announcing the release of the long-awaited um, uh, study of the food service in New York City, the public plate, a guide to institutional meals in New York City. It's available now on our website in three forms, the full report, the executive summary, which is a a uh, separate document, which maybe gives you a hint that the full report is a little on the long side, um, and a supplement, which is agencies at a glance. Um, this has been a, a long process, and many people who are in this room helped us to do this in various ways. I'm not going to go through all the acknowledgments one by one, but I do want to express our thanks to all the people who helped us by being interviewed, um, by steering us toward uh, reports and websites by commenting on drafts. Um, we're grateful a project like this is always a group effort. And our report is produced by the Public Plate Working Group. <laughs> okay, and the members of the Public Plate Working Group in alphabetical order are Sarah Barton. Sarah, you could uh, raise your hand. Nicholas Freudenberg. Uh, Jan Poppendick, that's me. Uh, Ashley Raffalo, who is trapped by uh, storm-related travel difficulties. Emma Sui, and Jessica Warwark. Um, Jessica is our remaining panelist, and she's delayed. And so we're going to switch around the order of our presentations this morning um, and do them a little, a little differently. Um, but let me just say before I introduce our panel that the Public Plate Working Group has learned from this whole experience the importance of institutional meals in New York City how important they are to our economy, to the provision of jobs, to the potential for improving the health of large sections of our population, um, to environmental sustainability, and to social justice, to meeting basic human needs for food. So we came away from this experience, I did at least, impressed with the, the significance of this aspect of our city. Um, we also came away impressed with the efforts to um, upgrade the quality of the food, especially the, the nutritional quality and the implementation of new city food standards, and with the challenge, with the difficulties. It is not easy. Um, I think any of you who have ever worked in institutional food in any way could provide us with lots of, of war stories and, and details, but it is a, a challenging task. I think about the snow and rain and bad weather again on a, an early morning of the week, and I think about all over New York, the thousands of food service workers who are getting themselves to, to work because people depend on the meals that they prepare. So speaking as a New Yorker, I want to kind of express my gratitude um, to all of the people who, who work in this. Um, we, uh, we have an exciting panel this morning because we've got both researchers and practitioners. So it's my pleasure to introduce, and I'm going to introduce all members of the panel, um, and then we'll um, proceed one by one. Um, but we have Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Correction, Paulette Johnson, who is in charge of providing about 13.3 million meals last year to um, inmates and correction officers um, in our city's jails. Um, next to her is Emma Tsui. Emma is an assistant professor of public health at the CUNY School of Public Health and Lehman College. Um, next to Emma is Brian Goldblatt, who is the sales manager for Green Market Company, which is an effort Yay! Uh, an effort to connect um, food 
providers, both private sector and institutional meals, with sources of fresh local produce. Um, next to Brian is L Chef Lynn Laughlin, who is the uh, chef at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, who provides uh, meals for seniors, for children, for um, hom a homeless shelter. And looking on the bio, I discovered that she's also the the godmother of one of my all-time favorite restaurants. Lynn was the founder and chef at Miracle Grill in Manhattan, and Miracle Grill in Manhattan uh, generated a Miracle Grill <laughs> copycat in Brooklyn, which was one of the best restaurants in, in our neighborhood. So it's a pleasure to have you. And happily, next to, uh, next to Lynn is Jeff Jessica Warwarg. And Jessica was the director of the center when we started this uh, research and is now, um, let's see if I'll get this straight, the Director of Operations and Policy in the Department of Strategy and Operations um, at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. So welcome back to Jessica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, we're really glad you're here because now we can proceed in the order that we had originally planned for our panel which is to say we're going to ask the researchers to tell us a little bit about what it was like trying to study this enormous, extended, um, varied and diverse uh, phenomenon. I think of it as kind of an octopus. Um, and then we will turn to our providers. So welcome, and I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sorry, there were a few trains I had to pass through before I came here. Um, all right, so this was a, a, a kind of exciting and in-depth, complicated research project. Um, Emma and I started out by thinking, well, we like talking to people, we like food, we like stories. And so we thought, how should we approach this? So we first reached out to um, Kim Kessler, who was then the, um, the food policy coordinator for City Hall, and we had dim sum with her. And we <laughs> talked about, um, we talked about what we sort of thought was the, um, the institutional food system in New York City, and we reached out to um, everybody we knew and could find who was working on this issue in different city agencies. And we, um, we sat down with them, we talked to them on the phone, we, com we compiled a big list of questions, we read through the websites, we read anything we could find, and we learned a lot. Um, we had some, a very fun conversation with Paulette about, um, well, a very fun and informative conversation with Paulette about, um, <coughs> about the overall food system at the Department of Correction, but um, we were particularly excited about the innovative Jamaican patty recipe that she'd come up with that's both heart healthy and very popular. And we also learned a lot about the um, food waste, which I think neither of us really expected to learn that much about, um, about the, um, the um, pilot compost program that the Department of Sanitation is implementing. And let's see, okay, and the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about before turn it over to Emma, is what we had hoped to learn in, in approaching the research. Um, I think we had approached it thinking, okay, we want to learn as much about this as possible, and we also were thinking, okay, well, we can probably understand this as a system. And what we quickly learned um, was that it's not a neat system. And we, you know, we knew that thousands <coughs> of people were working on this, and feeding millions of people, and it was a big, massive system, and we knew that the Mayor's Office of Food Policy and the Department of Health were all working very hard on trying to improve this public plate, and we kept, we were hoping that maybe we could help, you know, think of some ways to help them identify overarching ways to improve the overall system, and I think we realized it was much more nuanced and complicated than we'd first imagined, and that the responses and recommendations probably need to be very tailored and nuanced as well. All right. So Jan asked me to reflect on some of the challenges that we encountered while we were doing the research, and I would say that the two primary challenges that we faced, um, very much related to what Jessica was just saying, were one, the complexity of the institutional food landscape in New York City, and to the availability of, of some kinds of information at some points. 
And um, I guess by complexity, I mean that the agencies take a very diverse array of approaches to institutional food. And they do this for really good reasons, which are that they have different missions, they have different structures, different food service needs, and different funding streams. Um, so it makes sense that they would take different approaches. But for researchers, what this means is that it's not always easy to figure out who to talk to. And so we knew that we wanted to speak to people about menu planning, about purchasing, about budgeting, all of these different categories. Um, but those roles are, are taken up by different people in different agencies and dealt with <clears throat> in different ways. So figuring out who to speak to was a major challenge early on. And then on the data availability side, um, obviously that complexity was, um, there were occasionally issues of ac getting access to the right people or getting permission to speak with the right people. Um, but on a much smaller level, one of the data availability issues that we encountered was um, specifically related to food expenditure. So how much money is spent on food, um, the, we found we were missing a certain level of detail around um, the amount of money that was coming in via federal, state, and other funding streams to go towards food. Um, so those, those were just some of the challenges. And um, I guess, so Jan has asked me to talk as well about one of the clearer distinctions um, that came up across institutional meal providers, which is that of um, operations that are more centralized versus those that are more decentralized. Um, and so, for instance, the food system within the Department of Correction that Paulette will be talking about um, uses only five kitchens uh, to provide a mostly common menu to 200 different eating areas. So they're very much at the centralized end of the spectrum, whereas um, uh, senior centers and child care centers take often a more decentralized approach where meal planning, purchasing, and um, production may be taking place on a much smaller level. So they may be feeding 30, <coughs> 30 kids, excuse me, or 200 seniors, but it's not a system-wide menu. Um, and we know that the folks at Green Market Co. have been very helpful in providing some of those more, some of those smaller operations and perhaps one day some of the bigger operations <laughs> with uh, local, fresh, well-priced food. So we'll be hearing about that as well. Um, and I guess the last thing that I wanted to say about uh, this, this decentralized, centralized framework is that there are a lot of different advantages and constraints that go along with operating in those ways. And it's not, it's not a choice that agencies are making. It's something that often um, just has to do with their, their structure and the way that food service has arisen in their systems. Um, but there are some advantages to, uh, to being centralized. For instance, there may be economies of scale that are available. Uh, in conjunction with purchasing, it may be possible to develop specialized uh, products or items that fit with nutritional guidelines like the, the Jamaican patty that Jessica mentioned. Um, but at the decentralized end of things, there are advantages as well. So it may be possible to deal with um, different vendors or to purchase from different people or to be more flexible about purchasing than you might otherwise. And um, it may also be possible to be more responsive to local needs or to consumer preferences, uh, again, in a more flexible kind of way. So just to give you that framework to think with a little bit as our other panelists present.